Once again, my name is Dr. Aikala Chumarkwal, and I'm the African Union Ambassador to the United States. Woo! Not only the United States, but all of the Americas. I represent all of North America, South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. So, Grant, you got your work cut out. <laughs> And of course, some of you may not know, but Grand is South African. 1958, our colonial masters decided they were going to liberate the continent. France, as you all know, and Britain were the major colonial masters. France gave its countries two choices. You can be independent with no affiliations to France, or you can be independent with some affiliations to France. <coughs> not in their wildest dream did they expect any African country to not want to be affiliated to France. <laughs> to their surprise, Guinea and Mali say, thank you very much, France, but it's time for you to pack your bags and go home. <laughs> so in their anger, history tells us that they went in and took everything that they thought they had brought to those two countries. They even took the last teaspoon and chair. Wow. <laughs> they proceeded to pour concrete in the two, in, in the sewage pipes of the two countries, completely devastating the two economies. Mm -hmm. The newly appointed president of Ghana at that time, Kwame Nkrumah, in his efforts to help the two economies, created the first ever known union of any African states, which was Ghana, Guinea, and Mali. A few years later, a few more states met in Morocco, and a few others met in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. By 1963, or 64 rather, our colonial masters, rather our Pan-African leaders of the time, decided it was time for them to undo the damage that was done by the Berlin Conference of 1885. 1885 is when our colonial masters got together. After having traveled throughout the continent and found some very powerful kingdoms with very advanced uh, religious and educational systems, and they felt that there was no way they could conquer this incredible continent unless they were to design a program to make the Africans think that everything that was African was bad mm. and that everything was European, particularly Britain and France, was better. Wow. So it was by 1885 our colonial masters came together, took out the map of the continent. The more powerful a kingdom was, the more countries that came out of it. They sliced our Africa up like a piece of pie, and this gave birth to the countries that we know today. Economies such as Burundi, Rwanda, Togo, Benin. Economies that clearly cannot survive on their own. This was all by design, to truly make sure that Africa was a dominated continent, and its people were a defeated people. The seed of divide and conquer that they had previously planted across the Atlantic through the legacy of slave trade. Fast forward, they planted it in our Africa. So 1964, our Pan-African leaders came together to undo that damage. They created what we knew then as the Organization of African Unity. It was during that formative meeting that Kwame Nkrumah proclaimed that you were not African because you were born in Africa, but rather you are African because Africa is born in you. Ah. He also proclaimed that Africa was for the Africans and that African Union was now. Those words were as relevant then as they are today. By 2002, OAU was renamed AU, as we know it today, African Union. Our leaders meet twice a year to discuss issues pivotal to the continent. In 2002, they now classified all people of African descent living outside Africa as the African Sixth Region. 
the five regions on the continent are Northern Africa, Southern Africa, East, West, and Central. The African leaders also realized that through brain drain, not only through the ones who migrated in search of greener pastures, but those who are descendants of those who were brought across the, uh, the continent, across the Atlantic in shackles, they realized that for true sustainable change to come to Africa, it has to be brought by its children. Mm -hmm. Others have been building the Africa that they wanted. Mm -hmm. An Africa that is perceived as diseased and dying and constantly at war with itself. You see, that's again all by design. Mm -hmm. An Africa that is free and, and independent is an Africa that can dictate the price of its goods and dictate its own destiny. Mm -hmm. But an Africa that is in turmoil <laughs> is an Africa that can be exploited. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to where we are today. <coughs> One then begs the question, why is it that our Pan-African leaders 54 years ago recognized the need for the Africans to come together and unite and melt those boundaries that are really not our boundaries? 54 years later, we are yet to attain that perfect African Union. Uh -huh. One can't help but to be reminded that this all goes back to Berlin Conference of 1885. <coughs> the rule of divide and conquer, colonialism, and the legacy of slave trade sadly remains <coughs> alive and well among us. Let's look at uh, other ethnic groups right here in the Americas. A couple of weeks ago, I attended an event, fundraising event, by the Irish diaspora. The people who were there were congressmen, people from the State Department, World Bank, IMF. Two, three generations removed from Ireland, and yet they were very proud to stand up. <laughs> and the Irish diaspora, and that day alone, they raised over a million dollars for Ireland. You ask for the voices of Indian diaspora in this country, they're loud and clear. You ask for the voices of the Jews, the Chinese, the Mexicans, all very loud, clear, and present. But when you ask for the voices of people of African descent, us, you might as well go to the graveyard. Mm. Oh, why is it that we don't get along? Not only do we not believe in ourselves, we don't even believe in each other. It is easier for us to pull our brother and sister down before we can pick up my brother's hand and say, come on, let's go home. I was in Jamaica in January. A friend of mine, he's a minister in the Jamaican government, and we were looking pretty officious, <laughs> driving this, riding in this fairly new SUV. <laughs> and in the rugged old, behind us was this rugged old beat up uh, car. I don't even know what brand it was. My godson, a Jamaican, was driving behind us with his Canadian girlfriend, a young white woman. We get to the gate of this resort. And a young, energetic, uh, black Jamaican boy leans out of the guard uh, room and says, do you have a VIP pass? And of course, the minister who was a weekend, we were just chilling out, he says, I'm the VIP pass. <laughs> <laughs> and the young man says, no, 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 he just gets really angry suddenly. So we weren't allowed to go through the gates. Oh. We were just going to go into the resort to have a drink. Oh, yeah. He told us where to pack outside. When we went ahead and parked outside, and as we were getting out of our nice car, mm -hmm. we turned around. My godson with his rugged old car, he was going through. <laughs> and we said, did, did you have a VIP bus? <laughs> and the minister laughed and he said, well, didn't you see the VIP bus sitting next to him? <laughs> <laughs> two brothers who go and fetch water from the same stream. One is black and the other one is white. And the black brother puts their stand on the right side of the street and the white brother puts their stand on the other side. I can assure you, us black people, when we show up, 
we will drift to the stand for the white brother mm. because his water tastes better because he's white. Oh. Mm. That's just who we are. Mm. It's almost as if we've undergone a genetic mutation that keeps us from finding that, is, that love that is deep and wide. The love that you can say, I can love myself so much so I can love you. So maybe you can love yourself so much that someday maybe you can love me. Mm. Why okay. is it that others can find it as a matter of routine? And we have to be told that this is your sister. Mm. And that you are their keeper. Amen. That's right. That's right. That's right. I don't know how many of you heard the story about the young students at Cornell sometime last year. This and they sit here and tell you that your continent is a diseased and dying one. And guess what? You agree with that. So when the president says you're, you're shit of all countries with one corner of the map and the other corner of the mouth, he says his friends are going to Africa to get rich. So what do you choose to believe? You choose to believe that you come from a shithole country and you don't want to listen to the truth over here. That everybody else in the world is going to Africa to get rich. Going to Africa to take what is rightfully yours. How stupid do we have to be? Oh. Are we forever going to be servants, workers? Black people are some of the most intelligent and hardworking people I know. Mm -hmm. But we are so good at working for them. Mm -hmm. And then after we work for them, they pay us. Mm -hmm. And then we take that money and give it right back to them. <laughs> <laughs> We stay in their hotels, we ride in their planes, we go to their grocery stores. Tell me of the money that you make. How much of it is going to black people? None. Then who the hell are we? At what point are we going to say we're sick and tired of being sick and tired? We are sitting here while they are looting your Africa in broad daylight. If you ever fly low in the DRC, there are tarmacs going nowhere. They're coming in. You'll see planes flying into the jungles of the DRC, picking up minerals and flying right out. Mm -hmm. Those are thieves mm -hmm. that they don't want us to talk about. Mm -hmm. And it's happening all across the continent. So the question then becomes, what is it going to take for us to take our Africa back? The African Union is saying the children of Africa must come back home. When I sat with Madame Zuma before she left office, she said, my sister, I am handing you an amazing platform. And all I ask is that you find ways of organizing the African diaspora and bring them home. Mm. So I'm here today to say I am here to take you home. Mm. Mm.